There seems absolutely no doubt at all that this is Che Guevara. Uh, yes, they're now sitting Che Guevara up, actually sitting him up. Uh, his dead body is now being sat up. It's the most fantastic sight. He's a very pale, ghastly, ghostly yellow color. Uh, his head has rolled back onto the stretcher in which he was brought in. His eyes are still open. Balls of his eyes sticking out at you. And now they're lifting his head up by his long hair again, coming right back. The smell of formalin here is quite oh, terrible. Yeah, the smell of formalin. You can hardly I get near the body of Chegevara for this ghastly smell which makes your eyes smart. All the crowd outside are trying everything they know to come in. Uh, the, the, the forces are holding them back. They're holding them back with their rifle butts. There's a woman who seems to be fainting down here with the soldiers pushing her back. People are coming in from every side now. Every side, the crowd is crowding in on them. They're now telling us to get out of it. They're taking all the people away. Che Guevara is being held up by his hair again. It's a terrible sight. His eyes are rolling. Now that the army are telling him to get away, army officers standing all around the body, a corporal holding him up by his head, and now his head's rolled back onto the stretcher. We've got to go. They're coming at us with the rifle butts now. They're coming at us with the rifle butts. Bolivia, South America. Three weeks after the public death of Che Guevara, the man who wanted to lead a Latin American revolution. It is November the 2nd, a day of mourning in Bolivia, the day of the dead. But there were few tears for Guevara. The legendary guerrilla leader who had haunted the continent for two years died after a jungle ambush on October the 9th with hardly a whisper of protest from those he wanted to free. Was his death the end of a revolution? Rene Barrientos, general and president, heads the military regime Guevara wanted to overthrow. Now he can afford to be charitable. I respect all the men who has their ideals. And I think he fought for their ideas when they were in in the revolution in Cuba against Batista, I was with them. Also, we, we fought uh, 20 years ago the same way. In this country, we are in revolution. We make the agrarian reform. We nationalize the mines. Uh, we are educating our, our peasants, our Indians. And uh, so what they can offer, before they arrive, this part, I arrived three years ago, making schools, highways, bridges, and sanitary places for the Indians, for the peasants. So they compare the, the, our, our system of, of making the revolution by working and by building up with the system of their, of Mr. Uh, che Guevara fighting, shooting, killing uh, poor men. We lost at least uh, 57 men, very poor, most of them Indians. How can you imagine revolution killing the poor men? Most Bolivians are poor, and poor men listen readily to talk of revolution. But Guevara found little support among these people. To Bolivians, the hero of the Cuban revolt was just another troublemaking foreigner. And they've already had their taste of revolution. In the past 142 years, there have been 180 revolutions in Bolivia. But it's now 15 years since the social revolution of 1952, and the peasants feel they have won a sort of freedom. Bolivia is a harsh country, perfectly landscaped for discontent. It's an abrupt contrast of tropical jungle and hostile plateau 13,000 feet up in the Andes, where the air is thin and mere existence is a struggle. More than half the people live up here, scratching out a living. Before the 1952 revolution, a handful of rich families held this land. Now they have gone. The haciendas from which they ruled stand empty and neglected. And still the peasants toil as they've always done. The revolution hasn't made the frozen soil any easier to plough, and only when the rains come at the end of the year can the primitive ploughs bite into the ground. The reward is potatoes, the peasants' staple diet. For all the grinding efforts of more than three quarters of Bolivia's people who work on the land, over half the country's food still has to be imported. 
Things change slowly here. A man is no longer the slave of a rich master, but his way of life has hardly varied in centuries. 450 years ago, when the Spaniards arrived in South America, they were lured to Bolivia by silver. Today, Bolivia's most precious metal is tin. Tin is vital to the country's survival. Mines like this provide nearly all the national income. But in their cold and desolate isolation, they also breed a bitter discontent. One of the major problems, of course, is the mines, because it's only the one problem we have. We are a monoproductor. We don't have any other industry but the mine. In the mines, uh, we have a very high cost of production. Maybe in this moment, we are producing at uh, the same cost as the price in the market. This is very difficult. You could imagine we don't have any, any other amount to, to make better life for the miners. Seven days a week, eight hours a day, 1,000 feet underground. That's the life of a tin miner. And when he's finished, this is the home he has to come back to. Mud walls, a straw roof, and no running water. He lives here with his wife and four children. At this mine, 24,000 men, women, and children live in conditions like these. Yet the miners here are producing nearly half Bolivia's tin. In May 1965, the government slashed the miners' wages in half. Now the tumbling world price of tin has pushed many miners out of work. Those who can't find a job underground now dredge the mine's waste, hunting for traces of tin to be sold back to the government mining corporation for next to nothing. 350 women scratch hopefully for rocks rich in tin which have spilled down from the giant slag heaps. Ten have been killed this year. Some of them struggle on until they're 60. Apart from paying them for what they can pick up, the government gives them little. The mining hospital isn't for them, nor are the sparse benefits the miner gets. The conditions in the mines have aroused growing protest in Bolivia. One of the most vigorous campaigners on behalf of the miners is the editor of Bolivia's leading newspaper, Alberto Bailey. I know miners who work three or four years inside the mine, young people. And then they are discharged, they cannot go forever to a hospital, so they just go around Bolivia trying to find some, some little job with the children. And this is 25, 26, 20 years old. Uh, Comibor will not accept them anymore, you see. And nobody's going to accept because of the, of the, of the sickness they have in the mines. The miners being just 35,000 in Bolivia, they are really explosive. And the government will have to control them, sometimes brutally, you know, with soldiers, with guns, with killing. And uh, because of this situation, with no freedom, with soldiers there, the miner will come more and more discontent. And the next time, the miner will come with guns, for his own rights, and the government will have to use force again. In May 1965, every mine in the country rose in revolt. The army was called in. 500 miners were killed. Four months later, the army returned. More than 50 miners and their families were machine gunned. On June the 24th this year, the army came here. They killed 30 people, eight of them children. So, with the army in control on the surface, and with their union leaders dead or imprisoned, the only refuge for the miner was underground. Down here in the maze of shafts, galleries and passageways, the miner is on his own ground. Here he keeps Tio, his guardian, to protect him from rock falls. To deaden the pangs of hunger and fatigue, the miners chew coca leaves, the raw material of cocaine. Underground, the mines could become a fortress. In May this year, President Barrientos learnt the miners had definite links with Che Guevara's guerrillas. There were practice rifle ranges in the mines galleries and union leaders declared this mine an independent zone supporting the guerrilla cause. Alberto Bailey was there. There were several cases during this report we were making in the mines. Um, the guerrillas uh, were fighting in the southeast of the country that time. Um, apparently they were uh, all aware that the Che Guevara was leading them. and. Um, Two or three cases uh, of miners in different districts came to me and to other journalists to ask them 
if they could keep the secret, but lead them to the, to the links in order to join the guerrillas. Forty miners left the tin mines to join the guerrillas. Their faith now was in Guevara, the military architect of the Cuban Revolution. It was in this impenetrable area of jagged mountains and deep ravines that Che Guevara and the Bolivian guerrillas set up their base late in 1966. Ammunition and supplies were moved upriver to a remote jungle camp, but local people became suspicious when they heard jeeps travelling at night along isolated jungle tracks. They suspected cocaine smugglers, familiar in the area. Then, a hunter reported seeing a guerrilla training camp. In late March, an army patrol was sent up the river and was wiped out. Che Guevara's preference was to lie low and gather support, but the guerrillas had been forced into the open. Less than a month later, three self-styled journalists were detained as they left the guerrilla zone. One was the 27-year-old French intellectual and close friend of Fidel Castro, Regis Debray. 3 p.m., 29th of October. Debray in prison in the Bolivian oil town of Camiri. His military trial was still dragging on after 33 days. But World in Action cameras got past the armed guards with a signed pass from the military commander. Shadowed by soldiers and detectives, we were ordered to restrict our filming to silent pictures of Debray. The cell is good, you can see. There's, well, be, before, you know, it was uh, all shot, no? And yes. I didn't have light, but they have opened the, the window so I can read and I can write. I've been alone two months without possibility of communication. No? Well, a lot of official, officials of the army came in the, in the cell to, to hurt me, no? But of course I could not defend me because I was alone and there were 10 or 12. But that lasted only two or three days, you know? What did they do to you, Regis? Well, they... <laughs> you can only take photos and you must obey orders, we were told. If you don't obey, you will be reported and punished. Please, it's only for photos. Well, I have some books. I'm reading at Edouard, the French poet. Yes. I have five or six books, and before I had, I had 50 books, but they, they put them off, you know, I don't know why. If you want to speak, it must be in Spanish. No, we... It was five months after Debray's capture before his military trial began. The audience who came to the hearings in Camiri's hastily converted library were mainly the wives of local oilmen and journalists from all over the world. The courtroom was ringed by armed guards, and no one could enter without a military pass and a vigorous frisking. The trial lasted 53 days. Each day, at 7 in the morning, Debray was taken from his cell and escorted to court past the bristling rows of bayonets. Debray and Ciro Roberto Bustos, a left-wing Argentinian artist, were the two key defendants. They were jointly accused of murder, robbery and rebellion. Any journalist who got too close to the accused was manhandled. This time it was the Reuters man. Debray, whose defense lawyer was chosen by the army, was tried by military tribunal because the Bolivians were convinced he was part of the guerrilla movement. The main charge against him was murder. But most of the evidence for this was drawn from his book, Revolution in the Revolution. There was no proof which would have convinced a British court of law. For 53 days, the trial droned on in stifling heat. The women who'd been specially recruited to support the military case by spontaneous demonstrations in court became bored. The journalists flagged in the heat. Then, on October the 31st, Debray was finally allowed to make his one and only personal plea to the tribunal. As his defence lawyer wound up his concluding speech, a heckler interrupted but was quickly ejected. By this time, the trial was even more of a formality. 
for with news of Che Guevara's death, Debray had unexpectedly broken down and admitted his involvement with the guerrilla movement. He told the tribunal, I would have liked to have been at Che's side and died with him. I want to make clear that this mission of mine to tell people abroad the aims of the guerrillas is an integral part of revolutionary work. In this sense, I not only affirm but demand that the tribunal consider me morally and politically co-responsible for the acts of my guerrilla comrades. Debray's only public hearing was brought to an abrupt end. The same heckler, to Western observers apparently planted, interrupted again. The soldiers, who had been waiting outside, cleared the court. Regis de Bray was sentenced to 30 years imprisonment, the maximum penalty in Bolivia. He was never allowed to answer publicly the charges made against him. The court heard his evidence in private. But World in Action managed to talk to him through the window of his cell. Do you think it's been a fair trial? No, of course not. It was a repugnant comedy. Uh, because if you have chosen some witnesses, who are desertors or who don't have any moral quality to be witnesses. They have chosen some documents. They have cut off and invented some things. They have the main the main of all they didn't expose the journal, the diary of Che. No? The, yes, the, the diary. The, the, the diary. The diary. The, the diary of That's Che. Right. Because in the diary of Che, only a visitant who stays a short time and uh, they've told some things that are wrong. They've told that I have brought money to Che Guevara when I came. That's false and it doesn't exist in the diary of Che. Yes. They've told that I had a mission to with the Communist Party of Bolivia, but that's false. I never saw a communist leader here in Bolivia. And I want to speak a lot of things, of course. Not about me, but about the guerrilla warfare and about all what has passed here and about the intervention of the CIA and about the, well, the intervention of the Yankees here. Yes, sure. Tell me a little bit about the intervention of the Yankees, uh, Regis. What do you feel about it in South America? Well, of course, the intervention is in every part, but in some parts, this intervention is covered, is, is, uh, has a, a kind of, of mask of, uh, of, uh, of curtain, you know? Yes. But uh, in the preparation of the trial, it was great i have i have been uh, interrogated by some men of the cia and of course these agents of the cia are not americans you know panamera uh, puerto rican uh, and a lot of cubans of course contra-revolutionary cubans in bolivian eyes justice had been done in his garden in La Paz, the American ambassador spoke of the part his country played in crushing the communist guerrilla threat. The ambassador is Douglas Henderson. Now, we have certainly, uh, among our many uh, programs in Bolivia, we have known that there is a correlation between uh, public order and respect for law and order 
and uh, progress, social and economic progress. Uh, in connection with that, many years ago, the Bolivian government asked us to help them uh, in the organization and training of their army. Consistent with the plans developed then, we have uh, had uh, a program over the years of training and limited military assistance. When the guerrilla uh, outbreak came, we had already laid on a plan for uh, a training program for what is now known as the Second Rangers. That would have happened possibly by the end of this year. Because of the um, specific threat which the guerrillas represented, we accelerated that program. We uh, started the uh, training about five months ago. We completed it about two months ago, which means a three-month training program for, for the guerrillas, uh, for the uh, rangers. And then, of course, we uh, have since, at the invitation of the Bolivian government, had a uh, group training additional uh, so-called rifle companies. This is the American-run school of anti-guerrilla warfare. Establishments like this have angered those in Latin America who accuse the Americans of setting themselves up as policemen of the world. But they are undeniably effective. Within 12 days of completing their training, these Bolivian rangers got Che Guevara. Just how long have you been searching for Che Guevara and in which countries have you been searching for him, as it were? Well, we have different people in different countries, you know, working all over, especially in Latin America and Southeast Asia and down through that way. And many of us, you know, in some of the areas that we've been in before, I never could find him or he's always a step ahead of us. But here, I guess his luck run out. Them little Indians just ate him up. Are thank you God. Sorry in any way, sir? No, I'm not sorry. I'm proud. I thank God for his help, too. I think he was a professional soldier. He was a good man. He believed, he believed in his way and we believe in our way. But like the United States and so forth and all these other countries, we ain't buying communists and they ain't moving in. And they're not moving in the States, not if I can help. Or any country that wants their freedom. Americans have long regarded Latin America as their own back door, and they intend to keep an American foot in that door. So what chance does Master Sergeant Milliard give the guerrillas in the future? A guerrilla war, in my opinion, is hard to uh, terminate. Because uh, once you wipe out their main people, their auxiliary, and their leaders and so forth, They'll go underground till they get more leaders, then they'll come back up again. And uh, this is problems, what we call a problem area. And then what we try to do is solve it. If we can solve it by helping the people out, then we do it. If not, then we get some of our technicians or our specialists and uh, see what they can do about it. One specialist who made it his business to be present when Che Guevara's body was brought in was this man. His name, Felix Ramos. He entered Bolivia as a Cuban businessman. More likely, he's a member of the American Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA. So what is Bolivia's future after Guevara? President Barrientos knows his problems. If the governments are going to be uh, justice, I don't think we'll, we'll have any guerrillas. But especially, not only depends on Castro, depends more than Castro from ourselves. We have to be very in hurry uh, not to permit the people to be so poor. And for myself, I want only to, to keep on, to, to go on, to get on fighting and, and uh, trying to serve a, the revolution in Latin America. But that's very difficult from the side, you know. You can't do many things. The misery of people like these is raw material for revolution. This man, Federico Escobar, a communist and miners' hero, died just a year ago. Unlike Guevara, he was a Bolivian and is still mourned in defiance of official disapproval. 
If a leader like him stakes his claim before President Barrientos wins the fight against poverty, Bolivia could face its 181st revolution. Gloria, <laughs> 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 